catch me outside. Let's go. Also, I'm noticing in the camera, I kind of look like bad baby today. Um, accidentally. Bitch, this section f***ed me up. Yeah, so so what I wanted to read uh, in Pema Children's how we live is how we die. Mm. Um, it's just some excerpts from uh, three chapters. And oh, it's so good. Where are we at? 29 minutes? 30. Oh, my God. I'm psychic. Okay. So I'm going to skip around. But this is a great book and I highly recommend you get it. If you want to experience heaven, which I do, work with your thoughts and emotions. Okay. If you want to avoid hell, definitely want to do that. Work with your thoughts and emotions. It's like that. Therefore, in the next several chapters, I will give you some practice instructions on how to connect skillfully and compassionately with our habitual patterns and emotions, okay? So that you don't comment back and say, these bitches are trash and they're f***ing for cash. You take a second and you go, I notice there's some anger that I'm feeling. And then you deal with it instead of spewing it onto other people that don't deserve it. Say you have a propensity to feel inadequate. (laughs) Who would have that? Especially about your work. (laughs) You're in the office talking to two coworkers and your supervisor barges in and says, you people did a lousy job. I would be like, are you from the 20s? You did a lousy job. Um, The supervisor is actually criticizing all three of you, but you're the only one with the strong propensity to take it personally. So you feel totally wretched. As if it's all your fault. Oh, been there, my friends. Been there. There's already a long history behind your propensity. That's very true. It's very important to consider. And the supervisor's comment seems to add to the evidence against you. Now you go into full familiar storyline. I never get it right. I'm worthless. I'm hopeless. I always blow it. That's honestly nice compared to the I think. You experience yourself as a Loser. Loser. And uh, and beneath all these concepts is a horribly unpleasant emotion that you would do anything to get rid of, like smoke weed. Uh, in this scenario, it might seem like the cause of your suffering is your supervisor's words. However, the words are only the trigger. The actual cause is your pre-existing propensity. It's important to mention here that the point of saying this isn't to blame the victim. All three of you agree that the supervisor's words were mean-spirited and insensitive because she's a bitch. But at the same time, it's important to see the full picture of what's going on, which is so hard to do. Your propensity to feel inadequate was already a recurring theme in your life. Uh Uh-huh. Hearing you, hearing you did a lousy job was the trigger that provided the right conditions for it to fully merge. And that's the thing with the internet comments that I just read to you about like, wow, I looked up for you for, for 10 years, but because you didn't address this now, I'm like so disappointed in your white feminism, whatever. That's a trigger. That's a trigger. Okay. And that triggers my inadequacy of just trying to be fucking perfect all the time. That's why I go to Sephora and buy all the shades of lipstick because they don't know which one's going to make me look the best. It's like a uh, crocus bulb that lies dormant under the earth for much of the year and in the spring with the right causes and conditions suddenly comes out a brilliant flower. In this example, the two other people receiving criticism have completely different experiences because of their own propensities. And that's why I say, guys, your reactions are a result of every second of your life and how you've interpreted your life from the moment you left your mother's womb till the thing happened, till now. And when you consider that, yeah, everyone's going to react to sh- a little differently, okay? One of them has a propensity to get furious and take action, so he marches off to the supervisor in a towering rage, that'd be me, prints up some banners and gets a whole gang of people to sign a petition. Ooh, petty, I love it. The third person doesn't get triggered in any defensive way. Mm, She's an alien. But she still acts based on her own propensity. Her go-to response in any uncomfortable work situation is to become the peacemaker. So she acknowledges the supervisor's speech was unskillful and encourages the whole group to take part in a workshop in effective and nonviolent communication. All right. Well, that's a little dumb. Uh, when I, and that's probably not dumb. But I'm just rolling my eyes. When I look back on what the Karampa told my children, I now think he meant something along these lines. When you die, all that you take with you is your propensities. Ooh, I love that for us. And with that came some powerful unspoken advice. So you better take good care of your propensities now while you still have the time. 
I mean, goddamn, Pema. We already have ample experience with the trouble uh, our propensities cause in our current lifetime. I should say so. Example for me, fucking road rage. One time, I tapped a car with my car on purpose because he was trying to get over and I already let someone over and we agreed that it was a one-on-one merge, every other car. And this motherfucker had somewhere to be that was more important than me. And he thinks I'm a weak piece of shit. I'll just let him through. And so I didn't. And I hit his car with my car and he got very mad. Our unhelpful thought patterns are, and self-destructive emotional habits have undermined us repeatedly. Uh-huh. You don't say. Not only do our propensities disturb us internally. Oh, boy, do they. But they also manifest as difficult outer situations. Mm, mm, mm. Some people always have a problem with their boss. No matter how many jobs change, they consistently find themselves in the same uncomfortable situations. Don't I mean, that's definitely happened to me. But I also see it, it's more profound when I see it happen to friends where you're like, dude, you just you just. Every like like dating, that's where a lot of it happens. And every partner you meet is a certain way, like, like in a bad way. And you're like, damn, Sarah can't catch a f-ing break. But really, Sarah's got to do the inner work to go. Why am I attracting this kind of person? It's tough. It's tough to do that. Some people have problems with intimacy in relationships. No matter who they date, their intimacy issues persist. The actors change, the movie set changes, but the basic drama remains the same. This is because our propensities are the authors of the script. P.U. Something stinks. Another thing about these propensities is that they don't stop by themselves. We have to recognize them when they arise and not be so predictable. Oh, I love that. I love that phrase. Just don't don't be a hack piece of shit. And how about you react differently? You know, over and over again, we have to find our way to do something different. If not, they will follow us for the rest of of our goddamn lives. I added that part. We can go even further and say they'll follow us beyond this life through the bardos and into our next life, writing scene after scene after scene. They will create the outer and inner circumstances of our next moment, our next day, our next life, and all our lives to come. Boy, that sounds miserable as hell, huh? The other side of the coin is that because of the strong interconnected relationship between our mind and our world, we will often find that changing mental and emotional habits has a powerful effect on our outer experience. I mean, sign me up for that. It seems like a miracle, but it's quite simple and straightforward if you think about it. If you work with your propensity to get jealous, which I I have that. Oh boy, do I have that. We all have that. It will seem like there are fewer and fewer people to envy. If you work with your propensity for anger, also have that. Boy, I have that. People won't make you so mad. So how do we take care of our propensities? We get to know them with kindness and intelligence. We acknowledge how powerful they are, but we don't make them the enemy. One of my teachers calls them our beautiful monsters. And that's cute as hell. The Dharma tells us that all our experiences of discomfort, anxiety, being disturbed, and being bothered are rooted in kleshas, the Sanskrit term meaning destructive emotions or pain causing emotions. These three main, the three main clashes are craving, check, aggression, check, check, and ignorance. I mean, I got to be ignorant to something. I just don't know what it is. Um, The first two don't require much explanation. Craving becomes a destructive emotion when it comes to the point of being an addiction or an obsession. I was once given some Asian candy whose brand name was Baby Want Want. (laughs) That's so funny. Baby Want Want. That sums up craving quite nicely, I think. We, uh, we think something will bring us pleasure or comfort, like a freaking great shade of lipstick at Sephora, so we become obsessed with having it or keeping it. Aggression is the opposite. We want to get rid of something that we perceive as a threat to our well-being. Ignorance is a destructive emotion. Uh, it's a little harder to understand. It's a dull indifference of mind that actually contains a deep level of pain. That's really interesting, because you never think of ignorant people as having a deep level of pain, but... Everyone kind of has a deep level of pain, so that makes sense. It can express itself as being out of touch, uh, for goddamn sure, being mentally lethargic, not caring what we're feeling or what others are going through. When this state of mind dominates us, it turns into depression. These three clashes are often called the three poisons because as Anam, somebody says, I don't want to butcher it, they kill our happiness. They often, uh, that often happens to us in two ways. First, We suffer while we experience anger, addiction, depression, jealousy, and the rest. 
Then we continue to suffer as a result of the harmful actions they provoke. Yeah, that sucks. Because when I get road rage, you know what the worst thing is? If you're in the, Usually if there's somebody in the car with me, I won't rage because I'm embarrassed, which is awesome. But if it's like my boyfriend, I'm too comfortable. I don't get embarrassed in front of him. So I'll rage. I don't like that. And, you know, if he'll say something like, which rightfully so, he'll be like, hey, don't ask. Like if somebody's being a dick to him while he's driving and I'm in the passenger seat, I want to th- catch, catch me outside, bitch. Catch me outside. Let's go. Also, I'm noticing in the camera, I kind of look like bad baby today. Um, accidentally. But um, and then like the other day, we were going to a party, a baby shower party, a baby shower. And it was kind of a party. And we were driving and this truck, there's this giant truck behind us. He was driving. That's the important part. There was a giant truck behind us and they kept honking and honking because he wouldn't run the red light. And I went, I was, what I was going to do was I was going to, I went to remove my seatbelt and I wanted to stand outside my vehicle momentarily to just give him a look. That's it. All I wanted to do was go, and I don't know, maybe I'll add one of these. Like, I see you, motherfucker. I wasn't going to say anything. But in my head, I was going to say, I know why these bitches mad because they trash and they fuck for cash. But I was just going to give him a look. That's it. Because he was really pissing me off. And my boyfriend was like, don't, Christina. And that, oh, I don't know what what is lying underneath the belly of that beast for me, but it's something. Because I was like, don't ever tell me what to do. And I got real mad real fast. And I was like, <gasps> Oh no, sorry. I didn't mean to do that, but I didn't say sorry out loud. I said it in my head. Oops. I got to apologize him for that. But, um, but yeah, so anyway, that brings me to the first step to courage. The first step to courage, according to Pema Chodron is refraining. That that's my goal for 2024. I want to talk less and listen more. It's hard to do on a solo podcast, but I also want to refrain. I want to refrain from reacting. I want to refrain from indulging. I just want to refrain. I'm not used to that. I don't ever, ever refrain. I don't think I've ever, I'm sure I've refrained once or twice or a couple of times. I don't refrain from stuff. That's one of my problems. If I'm sitting at home getting work done and I'm like, this is boring. I think I should rent a drum studio space and go drum, do drum rehearsal. Or I'm like, I think I need new pants. I'm going to buy new, usually I'll buy something. It's awful. Um, so I got, I want to try to refrain from that. Okay. The true cause of our unhappiness is not outside, but inside. Oopsies. It's all up in here. It's all right there. Our propensities and negative emotions are what ruin our days, not our supervisor or our nemesis. I'm going to read that sentence again for the people in the back. Our propensities and negative emotions are what ruin our days, not our supervisor or our nemesis or the guy in the truck behind you honking like a piece of shit. As is taught again and again, as long as the poisons of the kleshas remain in our mind, we will not find happiness anywhere in the world. The Buddha taught three main methods for working constructively with our kleshas, which I think of as three steps to courage. He presented them in order of increasing subtlety and profoundness. The first is refraining from reacting. And I mean... This is the, probably the hardest thing in the world for me to refrain from reacting is so I'm such an overreactor to everything good, bad, neutral. I overreact to neutral stuff because I'm just like, it's so neutral, you know, um, there is a video of my friend group in high school where we were all doing impressions of each other and kind of roasting us, roasting each other. And when it came to my turn to be roasted, my one friend was like, ow, the Eiffel Tower just fell in my eye. And I was like. That's f- hilarious because that's very accurate. I overreact to everything. Um, okay. The first is refraining from reacting. This is based in the sense that there is something negative about the emotion. So we should do whatever we can to avoid making things worse. With the second method, transforming the clashes into love and compassion, we adopt a positive view of the emotions. If we use them in the right way, they bring benefit rather than harm. I mean, sign me up for that. The third method is using the emotions as a direct path of awakening. And this is the one that's very intriguing. Here, we transcend the duality of good and bad and let the emotions be just as they are. I found that the teachings of refraining from reacting can be very unpopular. Yeah, no shit, because we're in America and we react to everything. So fuck 
you. Once I was giving a talk on this topic and an old friend raised his hand and was clearly upset. He said, you shouldn't teach this stuff. It's like putting a lid on our feelings. Trungpa Rinpoche would never have taught us this. Leaving aside that I actually received these teachings from Trungpa Rinpoche, which, I mean, if that was me, first of all, Pema, good on you for not saying that. What a shining example of refraining. Because I would have been like, oh, really? You don't think he would have done that? Because he's the one who taught me that, you piece of shit. I realized then that it's important to present refraining in a positive light. To present it as an important step towards tapping into the wisdom of emotions, an essential step towards experiencing emotions as a direct path of awakening. My brother used to tell me, whenever you feel hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt, H-A-L-T, hungry, H, angry, A, lonely, L, or tired, T, halt, motherfucker. Uh, They should add horny, but maybe in another version. There's an instruction on refraining. Instead of barreling ahead and reverting to old patterns of blaming or judging or otherwise avoiding what we're feeling, we allow space. When we slow down, uh, we slow down the reactivity. Often I teach the practice of refraining. People like my friend ask questions to be sure I'm not encouraging them to hide or run away from their problems, which I mean, encourage me to do that all the time. I do it anyway. Uh, We're so used to everyone acting and speaking out that if we refrain from doing so, we may feel like we're avoiding things that we need to face, especially in the day of social media. Oh, my God. It's like, oh, everybody needs to know what I think about this issue. No, we don't. We don't. We don't. Okay? We don't. But the point of keeping our mouths shut isn't to duck out of the heated situation. The point is to give ourselves the time and support to feel what we feel and interrupt the storyline. Ooh, I love that. Interrupt the storyline. Mm, mm, mm. How we look at things makes all the difference. If we approach refraining as a means of shutting down, it can easily turn into that. But if we reproach it as a way of opening up and becoming more allowing of whatever arises, then this practice will serve us well. In his emotional rescue book, um, the author calls this a mindful gap. I'm not going to read the name of the author because I cannot pronounce it and I don't want to butcher it. And I didn't Google the pronunciation before I got here. And I apologize. It's as if we step back and become more present and awake to what's happening. We allow some space, some mindful space, embodied, present, and kind. And then the practice of halting and refraining is the most basic way of working with our clashes. Don't speak. Don't act. Get in touch with what we're feeling. It's the first method we need because when we perpetuate our storylines or act out, we don't have the mental space to apply the other two practices, transforming the emotions and using them as a direct path of awakening. People often want to skip the first stage, but that is doomed to backfire. As Ken McLeod says in Reflections on Silver River, it is often unthinkably frightening to experience what goes on inside of you. If you wish to be free, however, you have no choice. I mean, great work. Great work, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go smoke weed and ride a bicycle home as I listen to Beyonce in my headphones. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be the voice in your head. And if you have screenshots of boy theater conversations, DM them to me at Christina Hutch. Or if you have any alien or ghost stories, or if you have any videos of aliens or ghosts, definitely DM me at Christina Hutch and uh, sign up for my Patreon. I I host group Zoom Sherapy four times a month and uh, patreon.com slash Christina Hutchinson. I got to say, I'm pretty good at the advice thing. And I encourage everybody every time to take everything I say. And and if anybody else has things to say in these Zooms, you take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Take everything with a grain of salt. If it resonates with you, awesome. If it doesn't, Throw it right in the trash. Because these bitches mad because they trash and they fucking for cash. Okay? Um, so thank you so much. Congrats on not killing yourself. I'll talk to you next Monday. Someday we'll be friends with the voices in our heads. The voices in our heads.